So in a lot of my videos, I've sort of discussed how medieval Christianity and sort of early modern Christianity has really been instrumental in forming modern racism as we understand it today. However, I've never done like a really deep dive into the topic and I haven't explained it like thoroughly. So I thought I'd take this opportunity in this video to do that today. And there's two events I really want to get into. So that is obviously the formation of the transatlantic slave trade and the black legend, which was this propaganda used by Protestants against Catholics. But to stay in a more chronological order, I'll start with the slave trade. So Iberia, which today we now know as Spain and Portugal, was invaded by Muslim armies in 711 AD, and they took over most of the Iberian territories with the small part of the north which remained Christian. But yeah, for about you know 700 years, there was a prominent Muslim presence in Iberia, and for you know, many of those centuries they completely dominated it and what people kind of get confused is that it didn't really have loyalty to you know, other Islamic armies and caliphates back home. It started its own caliphate in Iberia. But in the 1400s, the caliphates really began to weaken and the Christians took out their territory. So you had, you know, the Kingdom of Portugal being formed properly. You had many of these territories coming under, you know, different Christian kings. For example, you had Aragon and Castile and places like that. And the Muslims really only occupied the south in Granada and eventually even that was taken, I think it was in 1492. But the Portuguese started to expand their territory. They were looking at places in North Africa and West Africa. And at this same time, the Ottoman Turks were basically threatening to take over Constantinople and take over most of the Middle East. So the Pope had called for another crusade, but most people didn't really have an appetite for a crusade anymore after so many failed ones. But King Alfonso V of Portugal did sort of respond to the Pope, who was Pope Nicholas V at the time, respond to his call for a crusade and gave him aid and you know promised to fight the Ottoman Turks. And in response, he wanted something from the Pope. So to start with, the Pope started to recognize the Portuguese territories in North Africa and say, you know, they were legit territories. But Alfonso also wanted some more recognition of his newly explored West African territories and, you know, what he could do with what he found there. So in 1452, the Pope published something called a papal bull, which was kind of like just passing a sort of law or an acknowledgement of, you know, what Alfonso wanted and in it it read, we grant you the kings of Spain and Portugal by these present documents with our apolistic authority, with our authority full and free permission to invade, search out, capture and subjugate the Saracen and pagans and any unbelievers and enemies of Christ wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property, and to reduce their person to perpetual servitude. So obviously there you have, you know, the Pope saying, if you find Saracens, if you find pagans, because they've rejected Christ essentially, you can put them in perpetual servitude, meaning you can enslave them. So in 1456, this bull was reiterated again, and it took more, you know, the form of a crusade, and it recognized more of Portuguese territories. So essentially what it said is that, doing this sort of stuff, enslaving these people was a crusade and these people deserved it and by doing this you were getting closer to God, you were doing God's work. So it took on the form of a crusade and what people don't understand is that the popes called for numerous crusades outside of the more traditional ones against various Christian sects. So what you have here is essentially a crusade to enslave Africans. The pagan Africans had known about Christ but they had rejected him so they deserved to be put in perpetual servitude which essentially means slavery. So it's here where you begin to see that people were thinking that dark skin color means you are lesser because you know in this context it means that you believe in Christ less. Because what people don't understand is that racism as we understand it today is a sort of modern construct and I'm trying to argue in this video that the roots of it are back here but back in the day it was really about how Christian you were it wasn't about race so for example when the Crusaders went over to the Middle East, they often married Muslim women who converted to Christianity and that was all fine. And you have various other examples of non-white Christians and it was mainly, you know, if they treated non-white Christians badly, it was mainly because they were Eastern Christians or Orthodox Christians. It was mainly about how Christian were you rather than what race you were. But what you see with the Africans here and the Saracens to a lesser extent is that these people, because they were darker skinned and they were pagans, essentially they were viewed as lesser because of you know, Christianity. And I want to show how this sort of spectrum of colour gets reinforced a bit more. So obviously people like Hernan Cortez and the Pizarro brothers and everyone like that helped set up the initial colonies in the New World, particularly Latin America as we know it today. And what happened after they set up the colonies, the slaves started pouring in as slave labour for the mines and for plantations and things like that. 
But people might be wondering, you know, why didn't the Spanish and the Portuguese enslave the natives they found? So obviously a lot of them had died from the diseases that the Europeans brought with them, but a lot of them were still there, still big populations of them. You know, why didn't they enslave them? So what they thought of the natives was that because they had been so isolated from Europe, from Christianity, they were sort of, you know, like innocent because they believed this paganism because it's all they knew and they had no experience of any of, you know, the religions that the Europeans followed. So instead of enslaving them, they decided we're going to educate them, they're going to pay us taxes with their labour. Instead, it, it wasn't actually slavery. It's the way that they understood how to pay tax in these societies. So they worked for the Spanish, but not, you know, forced labour, even though it was obviously brutal conditions. It wasn't, you know, a great deal, but at the same time, it shows you the disparity between, I guess, brown people and black people and how the Europeans viewed them. And there was even laws passed back in Spain to not treat the natives badly and to not enslave them because of, you know, the logic I'm using here is that the dark-skinned Africans had known about Christianity, essentially, whereas the natives could not have possibly known about it. So the browns were sort of a bit higher up on the scale, but they're obviously treated really badly because the paganism sort of lingered in the minds of the Spanish. But now what you have today is, you know, it's more assimilated, isn't it? In South America, you have societies where you have black brown, white, and all, you know, a mixture of different things. But in this context, they did treat the natives slightly better and they viewed them as better than the black Africans. Because essentially the black Africans were all worked to death in mines and plantations and they were brought over from Africa as slaves. It's a bit of a different context. But you start to see the spectrum of colour and how people view different races in this context and how colonialism sort of created the modern racism we see today. So that is just one part of this video. The second part is how the Protestants would often portray the Spanish in their propaganda, but I need to get into the history of Spain a bit more. So I was obviously talking about how the Muslims used to own most of Spain, but what happened is that the Christians obviously pushed them back and it's called the Reconquista, and I think, it, like I said before, it finishes in 1492. But what you have in 1492 is the Christians owning a lot of territory where loads of Muslims live. Now, what are they to do with all these Muslim people? You know, it's unpractical to kill all of them, but it's not saying that that's not an option that they thought of. So they decided they would do mass conversions of these Muslim people. So they would get priests to go into their villages and spray loads of them in water. Like, it was mass baptisms, essentially. It was, it's really strange but it wasn't really enforced. So what actually happened is most of these Muslims, although they converted to Christianity, they still practiced Islam. And this was pretty well known, but also it had been done before to the Jews in Iberia and they called the Jews conversos and they called the Muslims moriscos. And essentially what they believed, even if these guys were Christian, because they had Muslim and Jewish blood, they couldn't be pure Christians they were still somehow loyal to that faith and they weren't really followers of Christ. Because even if these Muslim had converted properly, which some of them actually did, they were never seen as true Christians. So again, you see how Christianity plays into this racism. It's that if you're, you know, you have blood from a different culture, like Jews and Muslims from a different race, you can't be Christian. If you're a black African and you rejected Christ, you're seen as subhuman as well. So you can see where the broad strokes of racism come into play. Now, the history of the Moriscos is pretty brutal. The Spanish passed numerous laws against their community saying they couldn't speak Arabic. They had to learn Castilian within two years. And this prompted the Granadan Revolt in 1567. And it was a pretty brutal conflict. The Moriscos actually did pretty well getting the Spanish. And the Ottoman Turks did promise their leaders assistance, which never actually arrived. And eventually what happened is that the leaders were killed and they were subjugated more. And in 1609, the decision was finally taken to get rid of all the Moriscos from Spain. And they moved them all over to North Africa. But they did actually consider just taking them out into the ocean and drowning all of them. And I think my lecturer said back at university, it's one of the first, you know, final solutions, which we hear when we talk about the Holocaust in European history, the sense that they want to kill all this racial minority in Spain just because they're a different race, essentially. So like I'm saying, you can see the origins of modern racism in these events around Iberia. But what was kind of ironic is that the Protestants took this Spanish view of the Muslims and Jews and actually applied it to the Spanish. So as a lot of you are probably aware, in 1517, Martin Luther, a monk, published his grievances in public on a church door, I think, and basically outlined all the ways the Catholic Church was corrupt, all the problems he had with their following of Christ, 
and this helped spark the Protestant Reformation, which also helped spark these big, big wars. So you had the French Wars of Religion, you had the Dutch revolt against the Spanish because the Spanish owned the Lowlands, and that constitutes pretty much today Belgium and Holland, but Holland were the ones who revolted under William of Orange, and also you have other countries like England. So a lot of these very pale white European countries became you know, the hotbeds of Protestantism. But their propaganda also used what the Spanish had done to the, the Jewish converts and the Muslim converts, but they applied it to the Spanish because they're like, the Spanish have dark features, the Spanish have black hair, they have black beards, black eyes, just like me essentially. But they're like, these Spanish people have Muslim and Jewish blood in them because they're not white like you and me, they're not pure Christians like you and me. Look, look at them, they must have you know, Muslim ancestors, they must have Jewish ancestors. Their blood is not pure Christian. And they use that in their propaganda against the Spanish, saying, you know, essentially they weren't pure whites. And this is how you get Christianity being associated with whiteness and non-Christianity being associated with darkness. And that is the spectrum you have. So you have the blood in terms of in Spain and in Europe, and then you have the skin colour in terms of the Africans and the natives. And I'm not saying this is the all-encompassing reason racism exists, but you can see how, you know, viewing people in this way at this time through the lens of Christianity has contributed to modern day racism. So of course, in the slavery aspect, you build your society on treating Africans as subhuman because initially they aren't Christians. So they're fit to be put in perpetual servitude to Christians. But you see over centuries how it builds up as, as Africans being totally subhuman just because they're African and black. You know, Christianity has nothing to do with it. Even if they are Christian, they're still subhuman. And you see how that takes root. And then you have the blood stuff for the Spanish. And you see, you know, a link between that and, you know, anti-Semitism throughout Europe and lots of racism against Arabs and Muslims. You see how it takes hold. And you have both of them together through the lens of Christianity, where essentially it means dark non-white people, bad, white people, good. That's the spectrum it paints. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing, but I just wanted to make people aware of how this racism sort of took root. And there's other examples I can think of, and then maybe there's another video to be made on this topic. But these are two of the big ones, in my opinion, you know, the African slave trade really goes without saying, but I wanted to give you context on why the Africans in particular, and obviously a lot of people are probably unfamiliar with the Jewish stuff and the Muslim stuff in Spain. So I wanted to paint light on that too. And you know, this sort of rhetoric and language that you hear used at the time is pretty re reminiscent of racist today and racist in the 20th century. So it's easy to draw a line between these two events and modern day racism. So let me know what you guys think of this video. Please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to follow me on social media, follow me at The Cavernacle on both Twitter and Instagram. I also have a WordPress blog where I write some stuff. So that's just The Cavernacle WordPress. I also have a Patreon now. So massive thank you to my patrons. And you know, I really appreciate the support you've given me. So if you want to check that out, that is just in my description. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.